she was two before she was diagnosed and she was just your typical happy, bubbly little girl that loved playing and get, doing messy play and stuff. She was always active with everyone, very um, approachable, very intrigued in meeting people, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Very friendly and sociable, yeah. I suppose, yeah. Before she was diagnosed with NF1, we noticed she had marks on her skin called cafe au lait. So they're a little brown mark. They're just light brown marks. They're kind of coffee stains, they're known as as well. And she had an enlarged head. So they're kind of two of the diagnosing criteria for NF1. So then when she was diagnosed a few months after that, we noticed that she was falling over a lot. And even though she was only two, she was complaining of feeling dizzy. So we were referred on to the Cork University Hospital to get checked over there. The first time she was hospitalised, we were gone out of the house for just under two weeks, 13 days. So when she was complaining of feeling dizzy, we were sent to Cork University Hospital for an MRI. But we had to stay overnight because they couldn't do it straight away. So we were two days waiting for the MRI. And then we were brought by ambulance to Temple Street and it was a further five days there before they made a decision on what to do. And she had two brain operations then. One was a biopsy to check whether the tumour that they found was benign or malignant. And thankfully it was benign. And then she had an operation to insert a shunt. The tumour had caused something called hydrocephalus, which is a buildup of fluid on the brain. So she needed a VP shunt put in to help alleviate the symptoms and that was why she was falling over a lot. We weren't expecting it at all. It's like when she went to the hospital in Cork, that time we weren't expecting anything like this to come. So we were quite unprepared for what was going to come. It's um, a neurological condition and it's often genetic and it causes tumours to grow on the nerves. The tumours are often benign but because they're on the nerves it's often hard to operate on them without causing more damage and chemotherapy is often the only option because if you have radiation they can grow back more aggressive. Then there's other, like you can have learning difficulties with it and it can affect your mobility kind of very vast, like every person with NF is different and how it affects them is different. The chemotherapy was a 70 week round of chemotherapy. Um, for the first 10 weeks of it, it was up in Dublin and it ha just so happened that the first week, it was the same time as the cyber hack. So we had to keep traveling up and down to Dublin, but then we got moved to Cork into the Mercy and it, was, it made things a little bit easier so we didn't have to spend all the time travelling. Yeah, it was a much quicker process in the Mercy. I think, you know, it didn't take up as much of the day. So then after that, we were able to kind of go and make the day a little bit more fun for Alana by going to her favourite restaurant or getting time to go to the playground or the beach or something. For Alana, when she was first diagnosed after having the shunt fitted and we came home, it was a further 18 months before she started chemotherapy. She was put on something called Watch and Wait. So while we were in hospital in Temple Street for the VP shunt, we just explained that the doctors were going to try and help her so that she didn't fall over as much. And then we got some storybooks to help explain, you know, what a tumour is and what MRIs are, and that she had to go to hospital for MRIs just to check that her shunt was still working and stuff. And she kind of, she's, she loves books and reading and stuff, so it was kind of a great way of explaining it all to her. Her oncologist we'd be very close with and when she did start chemotherapy she ended up going to the Mercy in Cork and there was a doctor there who made her Fridays a lot easier. He was always telling jokes and laughing with her and it just made it made the experience a little bit easier for her. Who did we meet and tell jokes to? That's the first one and I remember the one about the toilet paper. You did. What is it? How do you get a tissue to dance? We're a little boogie yeah. We've even met him in another hospital and he came over straight away asking about her and asking how we're all doing as a family. So you need that support from the... Well, Alana was in preschool at the time, so she missed out on two days a week when she started her chemo, a Thursday and a Friday. I suppose 
they were quite hard for her on the Thursday because she had to get a gripper needle put into her port and at the start those days were quite tough but they seemed to to get better the more we done them I suppose. Her preschool were quite supportive and good that you know if they had special days planned like costume day or a Halloween party they'd always put on another day so that Lana would be included as well so it was very kind of them to do that. She, she's become kind of members of a few charities. She's a little blue hero and she's an Oscars kid, which means that they just kind of do nice fun things for them. Like she got to meet the Blue Knights Motorcycle Club, which is former police officers. Yeah, retired police, motorbike police officers from around the world, which formed a kind of, I suppose, a charity organization. And they had a meet up in Clarny a couple of months ago and they all came over. They give her an um, uh, electronic motorbike decked out with all the the Garda stickers. She's received a little bit of support through um, Recovery Haven in Kerry. They've provided um, play therapy for her. Um, and then I suppose the support from being part of, you know, the Little Blue Heroes or the Oscars kids that have made it fun. I think it was hard to have support with COVID that everything was quite isolated and stuff. But other than that, family and friends have supported her hugely as well, that they've all really combined her and the community have as well, that everyone makes sure that they say hello to her and makes a fuss of her and kind of tells her how brave she is and stuff. A friend of mine set up um, a GoFundMe page for Alana, kindly done it, and the support was amazing there. Alana's cousin done a, a truck run in Mill Street and that was shared between Alana and another girl that we met in Temple Street, that Alana and the child formed a close, close bond with, so. We've had friends do bucket collections and um, when they opened their baking business, they donated their sales to us. Um, the local athletic club supported us. We've had, we've had huge support, like financially and emotionally, I suppose. It's been overwhelming, to be honest, hasn't yeah. it? It's been great and unexpected, but appreciated. She's finished chemotherapy now, she finished in September, but the, the tumour has remained stable. So now she'll just go back on what's known as watch and wait. And that just means regular MRIs every three months up in Crumlin and eye appointments just to make sure that everything stays stable, hopefully. So another thing Alana got to do when she was finished treatment was she got her Make-A-Wish granted. So Lana is a huge Lego fan um, and kind of every time she had an unexpected stay in hospital she ended up with a Lego set to keep her occupied and going. So her make-a-wish was to go to the new Lego store in Dublin and she got that for an hour by herself and she got to be an employee and got shown how to do everything and how everything worked and she came home with loads of Lego to build. Um, she also got an overnight stay in a hotel which was very special for her because usually when we stayed in a hotel in Dublin, it was because we had a hospital appointment early in the morning. So it was just nice for her to get to go and have fun and just enjoy it. And have breakfast in the hotel. Yeah, usually she's fasting, so she doesn't get to have breakfast. Yeah. I love you. Bye.